Let's do that one more time, nice and slow, straight from Mississippi. Good evening. Good evening. Look at the person next to you say, y'all look good today. <laughs> every heart open, every mind and soul focused on the words to which God has given us to read tonight and pray through to bring glory and honor to himself that we might reach the entire world through the power of his holy and righteous word. The Bible says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. And because me to pass by them round about and behold, there were, they were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy to these bones, and say unto them, O ye bones, dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter in you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sin you upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Father, if there ever was a time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to wake up and experience the power of revival, the time is now. You have called us as your people. You have collected us together as Fragments of this broken and fallen world that your gospel may come through us as instruments of your holy presence, Lord, that you may speak to us in such a powerful way that we come together as the body of Christ to say to this world, there's life in the Lord God Almighty. So I prophesy as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them all above, but there was no breath in them. Father, we can have buildings, we can have buses, and we can have budgets. But unless the spirit of the living God breathes on this flesh and bones, we are engaging in a ministry of futility. So Father, would you breathe on us tonight? Would you give us that life that comes only through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you provide your Holy Spirit to do that work to which we cannot do? Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. So I prophesied as he commanded. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army, then he said unto me, Son of man, these are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, O bones are dry, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Behold my people. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know 
that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and have brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, then shall they know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Tonight, Father, as we worship you in song, as we learn of your will and your direction, as we hear your voice through the gospel preached word, may you penetrate our hearts. May you take the bones, the flesh, and everything together and raise us up on our feet that we might experience that New Testament forte that came in Old Testament writings, the breath of the Lord in Acts 2. Do that now in your sovereign name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if your heart said amen, amen, amen a second time. Amen. Just one more time. Amen. One for the Father. Amen. One for his Son. Amen. Very unbaptistic. And one for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Give God praise and thanksgiving. Would you stand as we sing about our resolve to serve that sovereign Lord? I am resolved no longer to linger. We'll sing three verses of this, and then we'll sing the chorus of Because He Lives. Y'all may not know that song, but I see we got some good Baptists that know some old school good hymns. I am resolved to follow the Savior. Let's sing together. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith. Without the 
Baptist. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We are glad you are here tonight. Uh, we uh, are gathering for our second night this week of our Global Impact Week. Uh, really, here at Cornerstone, the entire month is our third dedicated season of the year uh, as we've been focusing on making an impact uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the kingdom of God across the world. Uh, and the month of uh, March was set aside, or I'm sorry, the month of May was set aside as a time of global impact, right? Uh, some of you want to go back to March, and maybe that might be fun. It's too hot these days, right? We are just an, uh, we are a fickle people. It was too cold and now it's too hot. But we are doing this month of focusing on making an impact for the kingdom of God uh, in the nations to the uttermost ends of the earth. And this is our second night of a week that we set aside to focus our attention and to commit ourselves to the work of the Lord in this area. We've set aside tonight, just as we did last night, to focus on two primary things, remember? First of all, we want to focus on hearing the call of Jesus Christ, known as the Great Commission to become disciples and to make disciples from here all the way to eternity, right? The second part of tonight is our response to that call. As God speaks to us, as He lays that burden on our hearts and minds, that each of us has been called to be a disciple and reproduce ourselves all the way to the ends of the earth from now until eternity, we then have to make a decision about what we're going to do in response to that call. And so that's the second part of our focus tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm praying for God to speak to our hearts and minds as I did last night. And I've been praying for some time. I know many of you at Cornerstone have been praying for some time. We've come expecting great things, right? Because we serve a great God. God's big enough to answer our prayers, and we believe that He's already beginning to answer them, and He's going to answer some more tonight. But just so you're praying along the same lines I am, I've been praying. Three specific things. Number one, I've been praying for God to call out some men into future pastoral ministry. That God would use this season in our church's life to speak to some hearts and minds, to call some men out into the, uh, into the vocational field of serving His beautiful bride, the church, in the pastoral ministry. Second of all, I've been praying that men and women would be called out into missions, even being willing to go to the ends of the earth, if that would be God's command and desire. And we're already seeing that fulfilled as we talked about last night, one of our very own uh, surrendering to Japan, to, those, to that mission, mission field for the rest of her life, and beginning that first phase this summer. And third of all, we have been praying uh, about all of us being prayerful and responsive uh, about our giving to the completion of this great commission through our many partnerships. You know, it's not one or the other, it's all the above. It's putting our yes on the table and saying, I'm going to do all of these things because I believe God's convicted me and called me to do these things. What we said was that tonight and last night, we're partly spiritual, that is that we wanted, and that's the most important part, to hear the voice of God, be convicted by the Spirit of God, and have Him do a work in our lives. But we also wanted to use it as a time of education to talk about our many partnerships here at the church, what we're already doing and what we're going to do in the future. In that vein, last night, we talked about some of the partnerships we already have. We highlighted the cooperative program, the West Central Baptist Association. We highlighted Sing for the King uh, prison ministries and our direct work here in this church through benevolence in our community, church planting in southern New Jersey, and commissioning a young lady to Japan. Tonight, I've got good news for you. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to move on to another partnership. And that is a partnership that if you've been here at Cornerstone very long, you know about already. And that's our partnership with the gospel in India through Uttermost International. We basically do three things in that partnership with India. The first is that we give our church and we ask others to sponsor children to receive an education through First Baptist Chandigarh School. There, there are roughly today 1,300 students in that K-12 school with better than 75% of those students coming from impoverished slum areas. In India, there is no such thing as a free education. There's really not in America either. I paid for it the other day. But in India, there is especially not a such a thing as a free education. And so very many children do not get the opportunity to go to school, to be educated, to learn, and given that opportunity to rise above their quote-unquote station, so to speak. And so what this school does is it concentrates, it focuses on those kids that are in slum, impoverished areas, many of those families making as little as 50 cents a week, and it provides an opportunity for their children to go to school. 
For $30 a month, you can sponsor a child to receive an education. That $30 goes to their uniforms, their books, their meals while they're in school, as well as all their other educational needs. You really get to play a great opportunity, be a part of a great opportunity to touch generations, plural. You get an opportunity to make a difference not only in a child's life, but the lives of their children, their grandchildren, and many other generations as well by sponsoring a child. At the beginning of this year, our church set a goal of sponsoring 50 children. We were already sponsoring five to six children before we began, and we put out 30 sponsorships out on the table over the last couple of days. And I'm happy to report after last night, we were down to about a dozen. Let's knock that dozen out of the park tonight, all right? Let's go ahead and get those kids sponsored and make a difference for generations to come. Second thing we do with Uttermost International is we also help with church planting. Over the last 15 years, Uttermost International and First Baptist Church of Chandigarh have planted roughly 600 churches throughout northwest and north central India. Most of those churches meet in homes or local buildings that are made available to them. However, that is not a good long-term sustainability plan. For their sustainability in the future, it's important for us to help them build buildings. That, there's a couple of reasons why. It gives credibility to their faith and religion first and foremost. Remember that in India, roughly one-fifth, 20% of the entire world's population is there. What's interesting is that in one-fifth of the world's population, less than one-half of one percent have heard the name of Jesus Christ. It's a religious country, but it is devoid of the gospel. It is over 90% Hindu who worship over 350 million gods. That's a lot of gods to keep track of, right? With the remaining 10% being made up of Islams, Sikhs, Buddhists, and tribal religions. The second thing that a building does is not only does it give it sustainability, it gives, or it gives credence to what they're doing, but it also gives sustainability as a long-term witness that is not easily eradicated. In other words, let me put it like this. When people meet in their homes, in many cases, many times, those homes will not stay with that family for all that long. So what happens is churches are moved and moved and moved and moved, and the long-term established witness in that particular slum is lost. So when we build a building, when we build a church, we establish a long-term setting for the gospel to take root there in that soil. As a side note, by the way, also when we build churches through Uttermost International, we also provide housing for the pastor and his family as we always set aside the back area to meet their needs, driving down their cost and their need for our support in that. Another thing that we do when we desire to set out, uh, or another thing we did this year was we desired, we set a goal of setting out to, uh, to plant two specific churches. One of those churches will be planted in the Rajasthan province with a group of about 50 believers who are already meeting weekly. Now, what's interesting about Rajasthan is that that is an area in India where some of the strictest non-conversion laws are. That is an area where if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you actually have to make a public statement by writing a declaration out, filing it with the government. It is posted on a board, and the entire city has six months to reject or to call out that that, that statement to try to get you to recant in an effort to eradicate anybody who would sway the people away from Hinduism. We get the opportunity to be on the front line of one of those churches. We get the opportunity to go and help establish in one of those villages a permanent gospel witness to the testimony of the goodness of Jesus Christ. The other church that we wanted to partner with uh, already has a building. But let me tell you a little bit of their story. They've outgrown their facility. They have about 600 members meeting in a room about the size of one section of pews in this place. Now listen, this place seats 636 people according to our architects and engineers. That's quite a few folks. In India, they would take all of you and put you in one little section, right? 
They have about 600 folks that meet every week right there in that little building. They need to expand. God has blessed their ministry. They already have the money basically to build, to add on, but they don't have enough money to buy the property next door. So that's where that 13,000 of 43,000 goes to. So we set aside $43,000. We want to spend $43,000 to build two churches, one in Rajasthan and the other in a little town called Abor, which is primarily a Sikh area. With which, by the way, if we are fortunate enough to raise that money and to send it within the next couple of months, those of us who are going in December will get the opportunity to actually dedicate those buildings on that trip. That would be fun, wouldn't it? That leads me to the third way that we partner with Uttermost International. First, through sponsorship of kids. Second of all, through church planting. And the third thing that we do is actual boots on the ground. Every other year in December, we take a trip to India and we perform everything from school assemblies, women's conferences, pastoral training, evangelism, medical uh, needs, and the more. And it just always depends on who we have in those moments. This year's trip is going to be around December the 27th. It's going to be about nine days long. We have a goal of taking 25 people from Cornerstone Baptist Church. Surely we can do that, right? We're going to have our first informational meeting about that next Wednesday night, by the way, at 7.30 p.m. I hope you'll come and be a part of it. One of the best things about that particular trip is the opportunity to go to three different types of settings. You go on that trip, you're going to go to three different types of places. And some, some of you will get the opportunity to go to established churches where you will encourage the saints and preach the gospel. You will have an opportunity to do some evangelism. Others will go to where we call preaching points, where there might be one to five believers in a slum of 150,000 people, and you will meet in a believer's home as they invite all of their friends and family. That's a preaching point, but no established church has been there. And some of you will get the opportunity to go to places where literally the name of Jesus has never been spoken, where there's nobody there that we know of that's a believer. You get to be on the very front end of God's work, of, God, of the gospel coming to India. As you can see, there's a lot of opportunities. Not only the things we talked about last night, but in India, there are so many opportunities. For some of you tonight, you may never get the opportunity to go to the other side of the world. You never, may never have the opportunity to put your eyes on a little child that is dependent upon you to be able to go to school. But you have an opportunity by putting your yes on the altar, like we talked about last night, putting your yes on the altar through giving, through sponsoring a child, or helping us build some churches. You get an opportunity to make a difference that will echo through eternity. Others of you, by putting your yes on the altar, you are committing to going with us on our next trip. It's impossible to describe India to you in a few words tonight. The sights, the smells, the the sounds. You just have to go and take my word for it. It is a life-changing trip. Others of you, you're going to be given lots of opportunities to do some things, but you're going to get to go with us on that trip. Listen, you're going to share your testimony. You're going to have conversations with people. You're going to work in the school. You're going to have all kinds of opportunities, maybe even doing some medical work. We were actually at one point planning on taking Studio A dancers down there because dancing is a big part of Indian culture. I know that's not popular in Baptist life, but it's popular in Indian life. And so we were talking about doing that. I'm not sure we're going to get it done this particular trip, but the point being, there's lots of opportunities. You put your yes on the table tonight. You put your yes on the altar tonight, and God's going to give us just the right amount of people to make a difference from here until eternity. Sometimes we don't know if we will, uh, will this time or not, but because there's too many variables, some of you may even get the opportunity to go into one of the most persecuted areas in all the world, the Kashmir Valley, and just pray and encourage and spend some time with believers who are long past their lifetime uh, because of the persecution that's there. Lots of chances to support India. I hope you'll put your yes on the altar tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the day and for the opportunity, the, uh, the moments you've given us to focus our energy, our attentions, our minds, all that we are to focus those things on being a light to the nations. 
Thank you for giving us this moment where we can calm our hearts and minds, calm our souls before you, where we may just bask in your goodness, your greatness, and be reminded that you have called us to the ends of the earth, you have equipped us to the ends of the earth, and you have given us the ends of the earth because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One day, every name, tribe, tongue, nation, all of us will be together. We're going to sing one song, the song of the redeemed, because we believed in the same gospel, preaching of the same Lord, Jesus Christ, who died on behalf of all. Father, tonight, thank you for this great, solemn moment where we have an opportunity to focus on Jesus Christ and making him famous. Would you speak to our hearts and minds? Would you convict us? Would you draw us to a place where we would be willing to put our checkbook on the altar, where we'd be willing to put our time schedule on the altar, where we'd be willing to put our yes on the altar, where we'd be willing to put uh, our families on the altar, where we'd be willing to say anytime, anywhere to anybody, whatever you called us to do, would we as a people listen to your spirit tonight, commit to that, dedicate ourselves to that, and believe that you going to equip us for that and and celebrate together what you have already done, what you've already determined, what you're already working out. Father, you don't ask us to solve the battles and fight them on our own. You, you, You do all the work. All we need to do is get before you tonight, hear your word, and respond to it by committing. You turn the world upside down. With 12 ordinary men, what could you do with 200? What could you do with 200 in Sedalia, Missouri? Speak to us tonight. Your servants listen. In the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold,
is so sweet to trust in Jesus was written by a lady named Louisa. She and her husband and her child decided to go for a picnic on the beach. While they were sitting there on the beach eating, they looked out in the ocean and saw a kid drowning. So Louisa's husband took off into the water and he grabbed the child to save him. But that day, she watched as her husband and the little boy he tried to save died. She and their child watched as their husband and father died trying to save a child. She got home. She started planning his funeral. And she was struggling with how to deal with this truth. But she knew she had beheld her God. She had seen his majesty and his greatness. She had seen the transforming power of faith in Jesus. So before she buried her husband, before the funeral... She wrote the words that we're about to sing right now. I think it's so helpful for us to see where these texts come from so we can check our own hearts and see if we're able to say this kind of thing with conviction when it comes time for us to deal with pain that comes in life. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Sing, oh, how sweet. Stand with us. probably a new song for you so we'll sing it together but man I don't know if there's ever been a better text written to a song as we consider suffering frustration anger trials tribulation there's not a greater reminder to us than he will hold me fast listen as we sing the first verse and then you come in and join us When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is all. And cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Sing with us. When I 
fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hope through His fearful You can be seated. Aren't you thankful for our worship this week? They've done such a good job. We're about seven minutes behind schedule, but that's okay because we're on God's time and we'll, we'll make it up somewhere, okay? I promise. I want to just uh, take a few moments to introduce our participants tonight for our program uh, tonight uh, with us, as we had with us last night, I want to take a moment and introduce this good-looking dude behind the piano with that fascinating accent. Oh, uh, Brother Brad, we, uh, we have been fortunate to have Brother Brad Hughes with us this week leading us in worship. Brad is a Georgia native. He's from real America, right? <laughs> he currently resides in the Atlanta area. He is a graduate of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary Amen. in Louisville, Kentucky, he will let you know that, right? He's one of the good guys in politics. He's served in various roles in the past, uh, including his work with the Georgia Republican Party and the first presidential campaign of Governor Mike Huckabee. I first met Brad about 15 years ago. He was a roommate to my brother, and over the years, I have fallen in love with this dear brother. He is a gifted musician filled with the Spirit of God, anointed and passionate about authentic, biblical-centered worship. Currently, Brad has partnered with two Georgia representatives to found a Faith and Politics Institute. 
that equips churches to send gospel-centered candidates to run for political office, as well as training local churches about how to handle political and world issues in a gospel-centered and Christ-exalting manner. Finally, he is also single and ready to mingle. Tonight, our pastor is Pastor uh, Dr. Uh, Fred Luter. Dr. Luter is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana. His ministry began in 1977 with a motorcycle accident that he calls his Damascus Road experience. After surrendering his life to Jesus and the call to ministry, Fred began as a street preacher in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. After pastoring at Law Street Baptist Church and Greater Liberty Baptist Church, in 1986, Dr. Luter was called to Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, where he continues to pastor today. Over the past 30 years, uh, Dr. Luter has grown Franklin Avenue from 65 faithful members to more than 7,000 members. One of his most difficult ministry experiences, I would say, came in the wake of Hurricane Katrina as his church was destroyed and members were displaced. In 2012, Dr. Luter was unanimously elected as the first African-American president of the Southern Baptist Convention, where he served two terms. And I first came across Dr. Luter in either 2008 or 2009. I couldn't remember the year when he preached at the Missouri Baptist Evangelism Conference by coincidence at Brother Kenny Qualls Church in Arnold, Missouri. Over the years, I can say that although we have not known each other personally, Dr. Luter's ministry has impacted my own. You get those few opportunities in life to meet heroes, right? Folks that you look up to, that you realize have really done a great work for the kingdom of God, and, and you just, you just want to get near them because you know they're anointed by the Lord, and you just hope that some of that rubs off on you. So I'm on cloud nine tonight. I got to sit like six inches from him, all right? Uh, Dr. Luter, has, his ministry has impacted my own. I have loved, loved, loved learning from him through the years, even though he never knew who I was. Uh, he never knew where I was at or anything like that. But I've loved learning from him through his sermon broadcast, watching his ministry methods. And our people have even attended his church on our Mardi Gras mission trips. We snuck in the back, I think, right? In my opinion, Dr. Luter is one of those pastors that you point others to. You say, if you want to know what it means to be a faithful minister of the gospel in Jesus Christ, go follow this guy around for a little while. He models great character, grace, and strength. His biblical preaching is impactful, timely, and prophetic. Dr. Luter, it is a great joy to honor you to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We are glad you are here. Would you let him know how thankful we are for him? Brother Brad is going to lead us in uh, one final song to set our hearts and minds for the message we're going to hear. And when he's done, Dr. Luter, it's yours. Sing with me, speak, O Lord. And this is our prayer for us as we go into our time of preaching. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today. Your majestic love 
church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for Brother Brad, the singers. God bless you, other musicians. Amen. Single and ready to mingle. That's, that's pretty good, Brad. I just, you got a, a, a friend, only a friend can introduce somebody like that, man, in the church. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Amen. Give an obedience to God, my Father, Jesus Christ who is the Lord and Savior of my life, to your pastor, my friend, and brother beloved, Pastor Chris. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful privilege and opportunity that you have given me to be here tonight in Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedalia, Missouri, my first time ever in Sedalia, Missouri. Amen. I have gone all over the world, particularly in my times as a president of the Southern Baptist Convention, but this is the first time ever I've been to Sedalia, Missouri. I've been blessed by my time here already. You have an incredible, incredible pastor. I know I don't have to tell you that. God has blessed you with a great man of God. Let's give it up for Pastor Chris. That I said like you told me to say? Okay, just, just, just checking to see, man. Uh, but no, first time meeting, we've talked on the phone, we've emailed one another, but my first time ever meeting him, and just his spirit is just one that I just, just fell in love with just in the hospitality room. And just to hear his heart and his passion uh, for the lost and for uh, the unchurched, um, and he was mentioning in his vision about the India. During my travels as SBC president, uh, one of the years uh, during the SBC president, I traveled to India. And the losses there is, is even beyond what he talked about. The, I went to a place where, not far from where Mother Teresa is often is at, where people travel for miles and miles and miles and literally stand in line to worship a rock. It just, it just, it will, wrap, it will blow you away. It's just unbelievable. So I thank God for your heart, my brother, and for your passion. Thank you for this privilege. I know that Pastor Chris knows a lot of pastors and preachers across this city, state, and nation that can be here tonight, but I'm so grateful, my brother. You thought enough of this street preacher from New Orleans, Louisiana. Amen. Home of the New Orleans Saints. Who that, who that, who that talking about beating them saints? Amen. I appreciate the opportunity. My friend and brother, Dr. Robert Loggins, man, what a joy and a privilege to see you again. Uh, uh, some of you may not know Dr. Loggins uh, was an interim preacher, a pastor of the church where I passed at, at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, before I came there. And, uh, and they asked him to be pastor. And I'm so glad you told him no, because if you told him yes, I probably would never, nobody probably would never have heard of Fred Luther. But because you told him no, I came on the scene, and, I, I, and, I, and I, I'm the pastor of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Amen. But he's a wonderful guy. I've always, uh, and when I got home, when I got to the airport and got in the uh, truck, and they said, "Baby, I'm here." Uh, Pastor Loggins has picked me up. She said, oh, "I can see that smile." I said, "Yeah, he's smiling already." That's the thing about him. He's always, always been a brother to just love and appreciate. Uh, uh, if if you got a problem with uh, Pastor Loggins, you got a problem. He just loves everybody, and I just thank the Lord for you, my brother, and appreciate the. Uh, uh, seeing you again, and one of the greatest things he has done for me today 
is that after he picked me up from the airport, brought me to Gates Barbecue. Lord have mercy. I'm, dead, I'm still licking my finger. Man, that was some good barbecue. Lord have mercy. I know we're known in all this for our seafood, but that was some good barbecue. I tell you, it was incredible. Thank you, my brother, for blessing me uh, uh, with that. Thank you. Uh, 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 I saw Brother Don, uh, brother Don here. There's in the back. Been knowing him for years. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you so much. Brother John, Brittany over here. Thank you, guys. Been dear friends uh, uh, through the years, and I just want to thank God for each and every last uh, one of you. Global Impact Week. What a great opportunity and God has impressed upon your pastor the vision for this church, Cornerstone Baptist Church, to go into the highways and byways of life to share the gospel. I am so impressed with uh, Pastor Chris' commitment uh, to missions, uh, uh, to, to impact the kingdom of God. So the question I want to ask tonight before I give you my text is, how do you as a church pull it off? H how do this congregation... Cornerstone Baptist Church, pull off this vision that Pastor Chris has given to you to impact your city, your state, your nation, and your world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question of the hour is, how do you take what God has blessed you with here in Sedalia and bring it out to the othermost parts of the earth? I want to talk about that tonight from a very familiar passage of Scripture. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, the book of Acts, if you turn with me with that tonight, the book of Acts, chapter 1, I want you to look at with me verses 4 through 8 of that chapter. Acts, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8 of that chapter as we try to find out what it would take for a cornerstone Baptist church to fulfill Pastor Chris's vision in bringing the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, you'll find these similar words. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Here's my key text, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the earth. Our Father and our God, Master, we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful and exciting privilege to be here tonight at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedaria, Missouri. Thank you for Pastor Chris. Thank you for the invitation that he has extended to me and Pastor Kenny to be a part of this Global Impact Week, God. Thank you for Brother Brad and the music, God. Thank you for uh, Brother Loggins, God. What a joy it is to see him again, God. Thank you for the members of this church and all the guests who are assembled here tonight, God. I appreciate the fact that they've come from near and from far to be a part of this service on tonight. Now, God, do as I ask every time I stand to preach, and that is, God, let me decrease as you increase. Father, let them not see Fred, but God, let them see Christ. God, hide me behind the cross, God, that you may be glorified, the saints of God may be edified, Satan may be horrified, and all sinners will come to repentance. Therefore, God, stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my voice. Now, be so very careful to give your name all the praise, all of the glory, and all of the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, again, the people of God say, Say amen. amen. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come up on you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. With that text in mind, with that scripture in mind, with Pastor Chris' vision in mind, I, I want to preach tonight from the subject, Empowered by Another. Empowered by Another. Brothers and sisters, have you ever asked yourself, how in the world did they do it? Pastor Chris, how in the world did they pull it off? Looking back at the early church, looking back at the first century believers, 
Uh, Donna, looking back at the both these folk in the book of Acts, have you ever asked yourself, how in the world did they do it? Now, remember, according to verse uh, 15 of our text, uh, John, there were only about 120 believers plus the 11 apostles, maybe 131 people in all. And the question of the hour is, how did such a small group of people pull off such a monumental task of spreading the gospel to all nations? As a matter of fact, these believers were so effective in carrying out the Great Commission that the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6 that they turned the world upside down. Wow, that, that, that's mind-blowing. Uh, Logans, that's phenomenal. Pastor, that, just think about that statement. Think about that scripture. Not only their neighborhood, not only their community, not only their city, city, not only their state, not only their nation, but Brother John, these believers had the reputation of turning the world upside down. In other words, they shook some stuff up. They messed up some stuff. They changed some stuff. They rearranged some stuff. They changed some hearts. They changed some minds. They changed uh, some thinking. They changed some lifestyles. They changed some homes. They changed some marriages. They changed some families. They changed some traditions. And Cornerstone was even more impressive that they did it not just in Jerusalem, not just in Judea, not just in Samaria, but ladies and gentlemen, they did it, Pastor, unto the uttermost parts of the earth, so much so that when people saw these new believers, when people saw these new followers of Jesus Christ, when the conversation came up about these new believers uh, at the barbershop, uh, at the beauty parlor, at the mall, at the restaurant, at the chariot uh, races, uh, when the conversation came up about these new believers in the community, people would say, have you seen what? No. Who are the, the, have you heard? No. Those are the people. That, that's them. Who? Those are the who? Who are you talking about? Those are the people that's turning this world upside down. That's phenomenal. That's mind-blowing. That's awesome. Which brings me to back to my original question, Pastor uh, Chris uh, uh, Cornerstone. And the question I asked at the beginning of the sermon, Brother Brad, is how did they do this, bro? How did they pull this off? For such a monumental task, how in the world did these handful of believers do such a monumental task of spreading the gospel to all nations? Particularly Cornerstone, when you think about these folk were so limited in their resources. Think about it. There were no Bible colleges for them to study at. There was no Criswell College. There was no Liberty University. There was no Missouri uh, Bible College. There, there was no colleges to train, train them. But the Bible said, Pastor, they turned the world uh, upside down. They had no seminaries to train them. There was no Southwestern Seminary in Texas, no, no Southern Seminary in Kentucky. There was no Southeastern Seminary in North Carolina. There was no Midwestern Seminary here in Missouri. There was no uh, Gateway Seminary in California. There was no New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary where Lagos and I went. They didn't have any of that, uh, but they turned the world uh, upside down. Think about it. They, they, there were no associational meetings. Uh, there were no state conventions. There were no evangelism conferences. There were no men's conference, no women's conferences, no NAM conferences, no LifeWay conferences. There was no global impact week, but they turned the world uh, upside down. There were no religious TV stations or, or, or Christian radio stations where they can be impressed and inspired to, to hear people like Charles Stanley and, and David Jeremiah and, and Tony Evans and Bette Moore and Priscilla Shire and Chris Guffey. They didn't have any of that. But the Bible said they turned the world uh, upside down. There were no how-to conferences to attend, like how to witness, how to share your faith, how to reach the inner city, how to reach the outer city, how to reach multi-ethnic churches, how to reach the traditional or contemporary church, how to reach the yuppies and the buppies. They had none of that. But the Bible said they turned the world uh, upside down. They didn't have a beautiful sanctuary like you guys have here at Cornerstone Baptist Church with AC and with lighting, with multimedia and with lights and all of that, the wonderful uh, 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 sounds and, and pulpit. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have praise team that led by Brother Brad uh, and the praise team. They didn't have any of that. But the Bible said they turned the world uh, upside down. There was no organized Sunday school. There was no cell groups. There was no Iwana. There was no nursery to keep our bad kids while we're in church on Sunday morning. They didn't have any of that. Uh, they didn't have any of that. But the Bible said they turned the world upside uh, 
upside down. They had nothing, John. They had nothing. Down. Pastor Chris, they had nothing that we say we need to reach people in our world today. They had none of that. But the Bible said they turned the world upside down. These were plain, ordinary men and women who did extraordinary things for the kingdom of God. I mean, they, they, they faced fears, hostile, hatred, opposition. Brad, the Bible say they turned the world, Pastor, upside down. Dr. Chuck Kelly, president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, has a Hebrew word to describe this. Wow. You remember that, I just <laughs> So the question must be asked, how, how did they do it? How did they pull it off? Well, brothers and sisters, let me suggest tonight that, that these plain, ordinary men and women were simply empowered by another. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They had received the promise of the Holy Spirit and was now able to do what they could not do of themselves by themselves. Let me say that one more time. They had received the promise of the Holy Spirit and was now able to do what they could not do of themselves by themselves. In verse 4 of our text here in Acts chapter 1, Jesus then told his disciples, listen, do not... Depart for Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere, but wait for the promise of the Father. Now notice what Jesus told them, Cornerstone. Jesus said, wait, stay put. Don't go anywhere, but wait for the promise of the Father. And ladies and gentlemen, honestly, that can be part of our problem in America today. That can be part of our problem in Cornerstone and in Franklin Avenue Baptist Church where Lag is almost pastor, but now our pastor, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, that that can be part of our problems. And our, yeah, we don't like to wait for anything. We just don't like to wait for anything. We don't like waiting in the bank. We don't like waiting at a red light. We don't like waiting in rush hour traffic. We don't like waiting to get out of the parking lot. We don't like waiting in a line at the grocery store. We don't like waiting in a fast food line for, at lunchtime. I don't know if y'all like me, but uh, I ain't been saved all my life. And every now and then, uh, I may go to lunch. I may have a half hour, 45 minutes back to Chris for lunch. And I go to Mickey D's and, 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 and go in the restaurant. And I'm three, three people, four people in front of me, then three people in front of me. Front of me, then two people, I'm looking at my watch, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. Then I get to one person in front of me, and this knuck, I mean, this person gets up there and says, uh, give me a, uh, no, a uh, that. give me a, uh, uh, man, I, I want to take my hand and say, man, a Big Mac fries and a Coke, get out of line, I got to get out of here. So I sound like I'm the only one, I sound like I'm the only one. We don't like waiting for anything. But my brothers and sisters, you need to know that there is a blessing in waiting. I discovered when I went through my ordeal with Hurricane Katrina, I discovered there's a blessing in waiting. Joel 14 and 14 said, I'm going to wait until my changes come. Psalm 27 and 14 said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Proverbs 20 and 22 says, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Lamentations 3 and 25 says, the Lord is good, bread, unto them uh, that wait. Isaiah 40 and 31, one of my favorite scriptures, Tim, of all the Bible in the scripture on waiting. But they that wait, but they that wait, but they that wait, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up in wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, my brothers and sisters, if you wait on the Lord, God can empower you to do what you cannot do by yourself. That's what happened. That's what happened to these believers here in the book of Acts. They obeyed and they waited of the John on God. So the question of the hour is, what happens when you wait on God? What happens to sons and daughters? What happens to the children of God when you wait on God? Well, y'all ask some good questions. I see why you like this church, but right? y'all ask some good questions. That kind of frees me up to give you the answer. There are three things I see right here in the text that happens when you and I as sons and daughters of God, when you and I as the disciples of our Lord and Savior, there are three things that happen when we wait on God. First of all, when we wait on God, number one, you become a new person. When you wait on God, you become, brothers, a new person. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. 
The Bible says, the scripture says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria unto the ends of the earth. When you wait on God, you become a, a new person. Look at the emphasis on that three-letter word you in this one scripture. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. Brothers and sisters, when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, you become a, a new person. Think about it. Now, now go back with me for a minute. If you've ever studied this text, if you ever know who the disciples were, these were the same believers who just a few days earlier were running scared. These were the same believers who just a few days earlier, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, what, what they were hiding, they, they were timid. As a matter of fact, Cornerstone, they were so afraid of the Christ haters that the Bible said John, out of all e uh, 11 of them, because Judas had committed suicide, but out of all 11 of them, John was the only one at the cross. And the reason we know that John was the only one at the cross when Jesus was crucified, because when Jesus cried his third cry from the cross, he said, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And we know that son was John, uh, his disciple, who took in Jesus' mother after Jesus was crucified. They were hiding, they were afraid, uh, they were timid. But look at them now. Look at them now. Even though they were afraid, uh, can you imagine their mindset? Oh, no, they killed our leader. They're looking for us next. Oh, no, if they did that to Jesus, they're going to do that to, uh, to us next. They were scared. They were timid. They're afraid. But look at them now. After they waited for the promise of the Father. Look at them now. After they've been empowered by the Spirit of God. They're new men uh, and they're new women. The fact of the matter is they're new creatures. All things have passed away. All things now become new. Look how different they were once they waited for the promise of the Father. Think about it. Before the promise they were aloof. After the promise they were alert. Before the promise they were bickering. After the promise they were bold. Before the promise they were complacent. After the promise they were crusaders. Before the promise they were defeated after the promise they were devoted before the promise they were empty after the promise they were empowered you got to wait for the promise of the father before the promise they were fearful after the promise they were filled before the promise they were gullible after the promise they were gallant before the promise they were hiding after the promise they were heroes before the promise they were immature after the promise they were imitators you got to wait for the promise of the father before the promise they were jittery after the promise they were joyful before the promise they were kitchens after the promise they were knights before the promise they were lazy after the promise they're ledgers before the promise they were mediocre after the promise they were mighty you gotta wait for the promise of the father before the promise they were negligent after the promise they were noble before the promise they were opinionated after the promise they were obedient before the promise they were passive after the promise they were powerful before the promise they were quarreling after the promise they were qualified before the promise they were reluctant after the promise they were ready you gotta wait for the promise of the Father. Before the promise, they were silent. After the promise, they were soldiers. Before the promise, they were timid. After the promise, they transformed. Before the promise, they were unmanageable. After the promise, they were unified. Before the promise, they were victims. After the promise, they were victorious. Before the promise, they were wimps. After the promise, they were warriors. Before the promise, they were zany. After the promise, they were zealous. You got to wait for the promise of the Father. They're now new creatures. They've been filled with the Spirit of God. They've been baptized with the Spirit of God. They've been empowered with the Spirit of God. That's how, Cornerstone, you're going to do it. That's how you're going to pull it off. That's how you're going to win the lost. That's how you're going to share the gospel. That's how you're going to reach the community here in Sedalia and, and on the outer ports of Missouri and even as far away as India, your, India, your path to have given the vision. We must wait to be empowered by the Spirit of God. You can't do this on your own. You can't do this by yourself. You must wait to be empowered by the Spirit of God. But then there's a second thing in the text as to why the early believers were able to make such a monumental impact on their community, on their city, on their neighborhood, on their society, on their nation, on their world. Number one, once you're empowered by another, not only do you become a new person, Cornerstone, secondly, you have a new purpose. Not only do you become a new person, but secondly, you have a new purpose. Look again 
cornerstone at verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus said, but you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, here it is, and you shall be witnesses. And you shall be witnesses. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria unto the ends of the earth. Not only when you wait for the promise of the Father, you become a new person. But secondly, cornerstone, brothers and sisters, you have a new purpose. Once you're empowered by another, once you're empowered with the Spirit of God, you begin to realize it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your agenda. It's not about your title. It's not about your position. No, their purpose was now to witness about another. Their purpose was to testify about another. Their purpose was to tell as many people as they can about another. Their purpose was now to tell the world about another whose name was Jesus. Not Muhammad, Jesus. Not Islam, Jesus. Not Buddha, Jesus. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans, Jesus. Not the Kansas City Royals or Kansas City Chiefs or the New Orleans Saints. Their purpose was to tell the world about a person by the name of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. My brothers and my sisters, when you and I become a new person, you have a new purpose. And that new purpose is to tell the world about a man by the name of Jesus Christ. I tell the people at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, even I've been there 31 years now, and God has blessed our ministry. Thank God Robert Lagos is not there, but thank God I'm there and in 31 years I tell the people at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church it's not about the pastor it's about the master it's not about the leaders it's about the Lamb of God it's not about the singing it's about the Savior it's not about the members it's about the Messiah it's not about the creatures it's about the creator it's not about the elders it's about the LOM it's not about the building and the budget it's about the bright and morning star we got to tell the world about a man by the name of Jesus Christ for Jesus says for Jesus says and if I and if I and if I be lifted up I'll draw all men unto me so come on brothers let's lift them up that's our purpose come on sisters let's lift them up that's our purpose come on young people let's lift them up that's our purpose come on seniors let's lift them up that's our purpose come on cornerstone let's lift them up that's our purpose come on Sedalia let's lift them up that's our purpose our purpose is to lift up a man by the name of Jesus Christ Oh, how the reach of the masses, men of every bird, for an answer, Jesus gave the key. And if I, and if I, and if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So come on, church. Come on, brothers. Come on, sisters. Let's lift them up. Let's lift them up. Let's lift them up till he speaks from eternity. And he says, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. That's how the early church did it. That's how they won so many to Jesus Christ. They were empowered by another. And once they were empowered by another, they had a new purpose. They had a new purpose, and that purpose was evident in their walk. It was evident, Pastor, in their talk. It was evident in their lifestyle. And like man and my brothers and my sisters, once you and I become a new person with a new purpose, you cannot help but tell it everywhere you go. You, once you become a new person with a new purpose, you cannot help but tell it everywhere you go. Tell it on your job. Tell it at school. Tell it at the hairdresser. Tell it at the barbershop. Tell it at the football games. Tell it at the basketball game. Tell it at the soccer games. Tell it at the dance recitals. Tell it at Walmart, 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 Walmart. Y'all know we're going to Walmart. My grandmother said it like this. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. And then he said something, you ought to have been there. You ought to have been there. I know it's bad English, but it's good theology. You ought to have been there 
When he saved my soul, you ought to have been there when he put my name on the road. I started running and jumping and singing and shouting because of what the Lord has done for me. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but people need to know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. People need to know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's the answer to the financial crisis. He's the answer for the family crisis. He's the answer for the crime crisis. He's the answer for the racial crisis. Whatever the topic, whatever the need, whatever the crisis is uh, in your city, in my city, in your state, in my state, in your town, in my town, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the answer for the world today because he's the one that can change hearts and change minds, and change directions, and change futures. But then there's one more thing that happens when you're empowered by another. One more thing, and then I bring this message to a close. Thank you again, Pastor Chris, for this wonderful opportunity that you've given me. And Brad, then I'd ask you how long I had to preach, but I'll tell you all like Elizabeth Taylor told her sixth husband, I won't keep you much longer. <laughs> and she didn't. Brad, what happens? Chris, what happens? Loggins, what happens? Tim, Tim, what happens? When we're empowered by another. But John, the Bible says, down the Bible says, you become a new person because you're filled with the Spirit of God. Secondly, you have a new purpose. It's no longer about what you want or what you desire. It's about what God wants us to do. What does God desire and design for us to do? But then thirdly, you become a new person, you have a new purpose, and finally, you have a new power. You have a new power. Look again at the first part of verse 8. But you shall receive power. I think I woke somebody up. I'm sorry about that. About that. <laughs> but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Brothers and sisters, now it is no secret how these plain, ordinary believers were able to do some great and extraordinary things for the kingdom of God. How they were able to win so many folk to our Lord and Savior Jesus. Remember, there's just a handful of them. 131 at the most. But the Bible said they turned the world upside down. How did they do it? It was because they waited and receive cornerstone, the promise of the Holy Spirit. This new power gave them boldness they didn't have before, gave them strength they didn't have before, gave them courage they didn't have before, gave them a backbone they didn't have before. My brothers and sisters of the Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedalia, Missouri, the fact of the matter is when I heard the Pastor Chris's vision, when I heard what he desires for this congregation to do, the fact of the matter is, there's no way y'all can do this by yourself. There's no way you can do this on your own. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've been in your position. The fact of the matter is, we can't do this by ourselves. We can't do this of ourselves. We can't win the loss by ourselves. We can't witness by ourselves. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. That's a done deal when you get saved. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, he, you, he gives you at that moment the Holy Spirit of God. But I'm talking about to do the things that God has empowered and entrusted for us to do. You, you cannot do this of yourself. You cannot do this by yourself. You cannot fulfill the vision of the pastor and the uh, great commission and the great commandment without being empowered by the Spirit of God. That's why the text says, but you shall, but you shall, but you shall, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You shall go. You shall reach the lost. You shall win others to Christ because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because of that you've been empowered by the Spirit of God. Pastor Chris, when I was growing up in the Lord Night Ward of the city of New Orleans, my mom and dad were divorced when I was six years old. 
I'm in the middle of five kids, and mom worked two or three jobs, not to make ends meet, but kind of make ends kind of wave at one another. Some of y'all may, may know what I'm talking about. And so uh, my mom, Loggins, had this old fair lane forward. I, I could not wait to get my driver's license. Uh, uh, and back in those days, you can get a driver's license at 15 years old. And soon as I hit 15, I said, Mama, please let me get my license. Let, 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 me, let me help you drive. You, you're working hard. You, sometimes you just barely keep an awake. Mom, Mama, just, just let me help you. She said, boy, you don't know nothing about driving. I said, well, Mama, uh, you need to know something. I said, when you're inside sleeping late on Saturday, I take, I mean, I borrow your keys off of your uh, nightstand, and I go outside, and I start the car up, and I put it in reverse, and I put it in drive, and I put it in reverse, I put it in drive, and, and sometimes I go all around the block. She said, boy, I said, yeah, Mama. I, I, so, Mama, I, I'm ready. I, I can take the test. I'm ready to do it. She, and she said, you sure? Say. So, my mama got, let, let me go and get my, my license, man. My first time, with my, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license, man. And, man, I couldn't wait. Fifteen years old, I was driving my mama's car. Man. She had a fair lane forward, and had, was in a wreck once. I said, it was going down the street like, like, like sideways, and, you know, it was, it was really a Ford back then, fix a repair daily. It was really that bad. It was that. But man, for 15-year-old kids with his driver's license, even though it was a Ford, I felt like I was in a Cadillac. Diamond on the back, sunroof top, digging the scene with a gangster lean. Woo-hoo! I just felt I was somebody, man. I felt I was somebody. And I never will forget, one night, man, my mama let me take the car, Brad, and me and my partners, man, we, was at, we went to this dance in the lower night ward area. They don't only dance in India, but they dance in New Orleans, man. And we went to this dance, man, and, man, we had a good time, man, dancing to the Temptations and the Four Tops and, and the Spinners. They had a good time. And I looked at my watch. I said, oh, God, I said, what? Well, I got to go home. I got to get my mama call home at a certain time. So we run and we run out the park. And so we all get by about five of us. We get in the car, try to get the car started. Wouldn't start. So, oh, no. And I, I say, what's I don't know. So the horn wouldn't blow. The radio wouldn't come on. Lights wouldn't come on. I said, oh, no, man, I'm in trouble. And one of the guys said, let's put the hood up. Let's see what we can do. None of us knew what to do, man. So we just put the hood up. And, and man, we uh, still said, tried it. we tried everything we could, and nothing worked. And we was making so much noise that this elderly man whose house was parked out of, in front of, came outside and said, boys, what y'all doing? I said, man, I got to get my mama a call home. I'm going to get my butt whipped, man, and my car mama a call home. She said, wait a minute, young man. Wait a minute, young man. Let me come out and see what's wrong. And so he came outside. He said, uh, try to start the car. The car wouldn't start. He said, try to blow the horn. The horn wouldn't blow. Radio wouldn't work. A uh, uh, windshield wire wouldn't come on. He said, young man, I think I know what the problem is. I said, yeah. Yeah, he said, let, let me go get my car key. So he went inside because he got his car keys. He got his car, put it in front of my mom's car, put his heel hood up. He went to his trunk and got something I had never heard of before in my life, something called battery cables. I'm 15 years old, man, just driving up. And he got these battery cables, and what he did, he put black and red prongs, he put the, uh, the battery uh, to his good battery, uh, on the prongs on his good battery, and took the other part of the uh, 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 battery cables and put them on my mom's dead battery. He said, okay, young man, wait a minute, let me give it some power. So he gets into his car, and he said, okay, young man, try to start it. And guess what, y'all, the car started. Man, the windshield wipers are working, man, the, the I said, oh, yeah, I'm in the house, I'm in the house, I'm in the house. And all of a sudden, something that was dead became alive because it received power from something that had power. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, in like manner, at one time, you and I were dead and our trespasses and sins. We were dead. Do not pass gold. Do not collect $200. We were on our way to hell. But thank God Jesus hung him, uh, went on the cross for the sins of mankind. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. He hung his head uh, and for you and for you and for you and for me he died. And they took him off that cross uh, and they put him in Joseph Barra tomb. And Pastor Chris, that used to bother me. Why in the world would they put our Lord and Savior in a Barra tomb? Couldn't some well-to-do uh, uh, a believer uh, raise money to buy him his own tomb? Uh, couldn't a disciple do something? About it? Then I thought about that thing. Why buy something you're going on to use for three days? <laughs> so they put him in Joseph's tomb. And then on a uh, day all night Friday, night, all night Saturday, the whole Baptist preacher said, early Sunday morning, Jesus got up, all power in his hand. Dead, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? And then on the day of Pentecost, uh, he told his disciples, that, listen, I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. And on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit to every believer. And this new power gave us power to walk right, to talk right, to sing right, to preach. 
preach right, to teach right, a new power that enabled us to witness, to evangelize, to share the gospel, to win the lost. So much so that every one of us, not just the preacher, every one of us, not just the staff members, every one of us, not just the evangelists, every one of us, not just those uh, who are taught it, every one of us can win the lost. Uh, so much so that everyone, not just the preacher, not just the evangelist, not just the staff member, not just those in leadership roles, uh, but every last one of us who are believers and who's filled uh, with the Spirit of God can win people to Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, ladies and gentlemen, by prayer for every last one of you, and particularly for those uh, who are members of the Cornerstone Baptist Church, my prayer is for all of you that as you leave this service, as you leave this global, global conference week, uh, impact week, as you drive back to your neighborhoods, uh, as you drive back to your communities, as you drive back to, my, to your city, my prayer that when people see you on the weekend going to the barber shop, going to the beauty parlor, going to the hairdresser, going to the mall, going to the grocery store, going to Walmart, 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 that when people see you out in the community, they'll say, that's them. Who? That's them. Who? Those are them. Who? You haven't heard? No. Those are the people of the Cornerstone Baptist Church that's turning this community upside down. I've heard the joy bell sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I'm going to tell it all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves to the utmost. Jesus saves to the utmost. Jesus saves. He'll pick you up and he'll turn you around. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Jesus saves. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray right now for this incredible congregation called the Cornerstone Baptist Church. Thank you for the vision of Pastor Chris, and thank you for his heart to reach the loss in Saldea, in Missouri, in the other most parts of the earth. I pray for every member of this church, every brother, every sister, every person who named the name of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would impress upon them that if you did it with the early church, you can do it with the congregation called Cornerstone Baptist Church. So God, I impress upon everybody under the sound of my voice. It does the best. Brother Brad plays, and Pastor Chris will come in just a moment, that if someone wants to make a public confession, if they want to say publicly, I accept the challenge. I accept the call. I accept what the Spirit of God is putting up on my heart. And I pray, God, that as Brother Brad prays and Pastor Chris comes in a moment, that people may just may want to publicly come and make that decision. Some may want to come to the altar. Some may just want to come and pray. God, guide me. God, lead me. Press upon me, God, how to respond to the vision of our pastor. Then there may be somebody here tonight who don't have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You came because a neighbor invited you, a co-worker invited you, a classmate invited you, but the Spirit of God has touched your heart tonight and you now are ready to make a public confession of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ you're among friends you're among the family of God and knowing this pastor knowing this church they will open up their arms and embrace you and accept you as a new born again believer in the body of Christ God, I pray that every last one of us will accept the challenge, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
beginning right here in Chaldea, Missouri. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, Pastor Chris. Would you stand with me reverently with every head bowed, every eye closed. Don't want to lose the solemnness of the moment. Really, the invitation tonight is quite simple, and that is that we would get all out of our own selves. For somebody tonight, that might mean that you have never trusted in Jesus. You've never come to the end of yourself, never come come to the end of your own power, never come to the end of your own strength. Like the prodigal son, you maybe look around the campfire and want to blame dad and mom and brother and sister and husband and wife. You want to blame Mother Nature, maybe even God himself for the condition you find yourself in. But maybe tonight, through the preaching of the word, like that prodigal son, you got tired of looking around. And as Luke says, when he got to himself. Maybe tonight, you realize that it's not anybody else's fault. That you stood on your own strength, you stood on your own power, you stood on your own mind. And you get all out of yourself tonight. And you just lay it all before God and you trust in Him. You believe that what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary truly was good enough to pay the penalty for your sin. That you won't be saved by your works, by your deeds, by your good words. You won't be saved by your family, by who your mom was, who your daddy was. You'll only be saved tonight by precious trust and faith in Jesus and what he did. If that's you, you respond in this moment. Dr. Loggins is here. Pastor Tim Carter, come. You respond in this moment. We'll pray with you. We'll help you through that. We'll lead you to the one who has the power. The only one who has the power to give eternal life you come sensing that the majority of this congregation are those who have already trusted in Jesus Dr. Luter was so spot on we can't really impact a a country that is 20% of the world we don't have that kind of strength we don't have that kind of power we don't have that kind of money we can't really impact a globe, we can't really impact even just a little city. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We got too many kids. We don't have enough energy. Don't have a big enough church. Don't have the right pieces of that puzzle. I'm glad tonight you finally realized that. Now's a good moment to throw all that stuff away and realize that God is so much bigger than all of those things and that when we finally come to the end of ourselves when our glass is finally empty we're ready to be filled so for you the invitation is simple not worrying about the songs that we sing or the words to the lyrics for you the invitation is very simple now in this moment step out Grab your spouse, grab your family member. Maybe you need to be by yourself. Maybe you want to grab one of our pastors. Step out right now in this moment. They're all lying in the sand like we talked about last night. Where you say, no more. I'm going I'm to make a turning point right here. Step out now. Come down to this altar. Get on your knees before God. And confess your emptiness. And let him fill you up with his power. You respond right now. Let Brad sing. You respond and don't worry about any of the rest of it. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the Who road. Who else is going to take a lot of broken people to change a world? Who else right now in this moment? Try just get all out of themselves and ask the Lord to meet Lord the needs. And men, nailed to a cross of wood is the power of the cross. Christ
Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Right here's the problem in church in a nutshell. We keep depending on our own strength we depend on our own finances we depend on our own abilities and we got all these excuses what we're asking in this invitation is for you just to give up those excuses they don't matter at all I think of Jonathan's and his armor bearer charging a a hill a, a garrison of Philistines And they went on up that hill and Jonathan turned to his armor bearer and said, who knows whether the Lord is able to save by many or by few. Numbers don't matter to God one little bit. We could wipe out all $43,000 tonight. We could write a check and and we could could build those churches if, if God so empowered and you were so faithful. We could sponsor 700 kids tonight. If God so moved in his power and you were faithful, we could see a great revival sweep across Sedalia so that churches were lit aflame with the power of the gospel, that lives were transformed and changed if we stopped worrying about all the reasons we couldn't do it and just trusted the Lord to do his business. Last few moments, Brother Brad's going to sing. You respond right now. Get all out of yourself and ask for him to get rid of those excuses and empower. Get filled by him. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought Every evil deed crowning your blood stained brow is the power of the cross. Christ be sing these words together. Thank you. 